Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. This is uh, Florian Zulicker from, from Technical University of Vienna, where he's, I think, just finished his PhD, and he's visiting today here. So if you want to speak to him afterwards, then grab him today. Okay. Okay, hello, everybody. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here today, so because as uh, so was also kind of a wrap up for my uh, PhD thesis and my PhD thesis was uh, financed by uh, Microsoft so I'm happy to report results. Um, yeah, so this in this, uh, so I've worked on this with uh, Zomit Gulwani from uh, Microsoft Redmond and uh, with a master student Moritz Sinn and my supervisor Helmut Veit. So this talk is about uh, how we can analyze imperative programs uh, in order to get bounds for them. And uh, a solution, uh, a nice abstraction, is uh, called the size change abstraction. So this was the title of the talk is about, and uh, you're soon going to learn more about it. So what is <coughs> uh, the problem we are, want to solve? So uh, programs consume a variety of resources such as CPU time, memory, network bandwidth, and power. And uh, it's important to bound the consumption of such resources, uh, clearly because there are economic incentives. Uh, you can give the user better experience. And uh, like in embedded systems, there are hard constraints on the availability of resources. So you want to make sure you don't lose more of them. And interestingly, sometimes even the correctness of your program depends on bounding quantitative properties, such that if you leak uh, information at a certain place of your program, you want to know how much information you leak. And uh, if you have numerical computations going on, you want to make sure that your result stays in a certain uh, range. So we have identified uh, uh, an underlying problem which can help in, in solve these resource questions. And uh, this is what we coined uh, uh, reachability bound problem. And this is given some imperative program, as you can see on the right, uh, you have some particular location of interest, uh, L. So for example, there are some expensive resources allocated and you want to know how often uh, your program can visit this location. And what you want is a, a symbolic bound. Uh, and symbolic here means uh, symbolic in the input variables of your program. And uh, this definition can help you answering resource questions. For example, you can uh, ask about the time complexity of your program if you uh, sum over all, the, uh, over all your loops and you take the, the bounds for them. And you can get a, similarly a bound for the memory if you go over all the location where memory gets allocated and take uh, the bound for this location times the number of uh, times the amount of memory allocated. So under the assumption that you know uh, this allocate, so how many bytes you allocate. OK, so uh, clearly, uh, if you can compute a bound for a loop, this implies uh, termination of the loop. And so in a sense, uh, computing bounds is more difficult than proving termination. But it's a good starting point to ask if the successful techniques for termination analysis can be extended to bound analysis. And uh, so the recent years have seen uh, two successful techniques. So the one, the earlier one is the size change abstraction. And the later one is the transition invariance. And <coughs> so I will explain them more in a minute. And the uh, uh, answer will be that we can use the size change abstraction but uh, using the transition invariance is not so easy. So what is the size change abstraction? So uh, let's look at uh, a simple example program. So we have a loop and we have two variables. Both are initialized to n. And <coughs> we go through this loop and non-deterministically 
decrement either x or decrement y. So uh, in our setting, it's convenient to uh, think about this program as a control flow graph, where you have two possible transitions, so for each of the passes of the, of the y loop. And the uh, size change abstraction is now we take these transitions uh, and, and the predicates and we just uh, abstract them by uh, replacing them with, with inequalities. So if you take as a, your predicate abstract domain just a set of uh, inequalities between all er variables and then you just apply it, this abstraction. And this is what you, what you get. And you have, as you can see, primed and unprimed variables so we can uh, represent relations with it. So if you uh, think of this abstraction in terms of abstract interpretation, what you get is a finite power set abstract domain uh, where your base elements are conjuncts of inequalities. So why is it power set? So because we are having this junction implicitly in the control flow graph by having multiple transitions. And it's finite because there are only finitely many inequalities between a finite set of variables. Uh, traditionally, papers about the size change abstraction have uh, represented them um, like uh, like graphs where you, uh, and where you label the edges with uh, inequalities, but it's just a different notation. So the size change abstraction is a success story because theoretically it has nice properties. So termination is decidable in p-space. And there's also a systematic way of deriving ranking functions for terminating instances. On the practical side, the size change abstraction has been implemented in uh, widely used tools, such that ACL2 and Isabel, so both tools need, their, need to prove that inductive definitions are well-formed and so that they terminate, and they uh, do automatic termination proofs all the time. And in ACL2, this is particularly successful, they can prove 98% of their functions automatically. So why, why does it have such, uh, why does it work so nice in practice? So because you have built in this junction and uh, because it's finite, you can compute the transitive hulls without referring to uh, over approximation techniques. And the decidability result comes from that transitivity hulls preserve termination. And because it's, uh, you only have inequalities, you can do the abstraction most of the time automatically. Uh, so this sums up the potential for automating this technique. On the other hand, uh, we have transition invariants, and they have uh, been meant as a, an adaption of, of size change abstraction to imperative programs. And uh, so they have led to a successful tool uh, which could handle a lot of device drivers automatically. And uh, they are more general than the size change abstraction. And you can see uh, this paper for a formal comparison. So uh, I guess uh, you are uh, quite familiar with transition invariants. So let's look how what you can do for uh, how you will handle this program. So you will do a termination proof which looks like this. So you will prove that uh, so you will have two well-founded relations, and you will show that um, yeah you derive them because x and y are uh, local ranking functions for one of the paths respectively, and then you show that the transitive hull in the concrete is uh, included in the union of these well-founded relations. Yeah, so that someone pointed out to me and I didn't correct it, so that's true. Yeah, it's uh, back on the slides. But this uh, doesn't matter. So now let's look at a slightly modified uh, version of this program. So there you have the same program, except that in the one branch you reset x to, to n. And uh, so this changes the transition relation and but you can do the same termination proof. So this means uh, uh, only the part of the proof, which is the actual termination argument, this really stays the same. You have to show it in a different way, but 
the underlying reasoning is the same. And so what you see here is that you have two uh, different programs, uh, which have to, uh, and there are two programs which have a uh, different complexity, but they are proved by the same uh, termination argument. So the that argument you have is too imprecise to capture uh, the difference in complexity. So we have to do something more if we want to uh, do bound computation. So when you take the same programs and you size change abstract them, and then you will have more information in the abstract. So you will have uh, that in the one case x is the same and in the other case uh, access reset, you will have it in the abstraction. So you can see that this is more information than you have in the transition invariant case. So I will now give you a short uh, explanation how we compute bounds and then later I tell you more about uh, how, we, uh, how we do it, but this is, this is just to get the idea. So what we will do for computing bounds is uh, we will only work on the abstracted transitions and uh, we have some heuristics for discovering that X and Y are important here for the progress of the program. And then our bound computation will do the following reasoning for the program on the left side. So it will say, okay, X and Y are constant on the respective other uh, transition of the program. So it's okay if we add the bound and uh, so by taking the initial conditions into account, we get the bound of 2n. And for the other program, we will use the fact that only one, uh, one of the, the norms, so only x is reset on the other transition. So it's okay if we order them lexicographically and by uh, taking the, by proving that they're both bounded by n, we can multiply them and get the bound n square. Yeah, so this was the, the introduction and so why we want to use the uh, size change abstraction. And I will motivate it further by pointing out uh, challenging programs and uh, explaining the challenges there. And then I will come back to these challenges later on when I uh, explain you the actual bound computation. So by this challenges, I really want to show you that we chose the size change abstraction because it's the right abstract domain that can deal with this kind of problems which, which arise in, uh, in the problem. So let's look at uh, the following program, which I will use uh, as a running example. So here you have a <coughs> program that contains uh, an inner loop. And so what it does, it increments uh, uh, the variable i in the, in the outer loop and resets the variable j. And then in the inner loop, you, uh, you increment both variables. And in the outer loop, you sometimes decrement uh, i, but only if you have repeated the inner loop once. So in order to show uh, that the bound for the outer loop is really n, uh, you, are, you have to show that if i is, is incremented, at decremented, you have been visited the inner loop at least once and thereby incremented i, so that makes up for the later decrement. So what I want to show here is that for this, you need this distinction if the inner loop has been executed at least once. And this is really disjunctive reasoning. So in order to be able to handle example like this, you need uh, to you need to provide a disjunctive invariant about whether the inner loop has been executed none uh, times or at least one time. And then you have to combine it with the, uh, what happens afterwards. So let's look at uh, the inner loop. So if you want to, uh, uh, because it's the same counter, so it's i, and as we just reasoned, also the, the inner loop will have complexity n, but uh, a naive approach would just say it's quadratic. And, and why is that? So if you do a, a cut point like technique, you just say, okay, let's isolate the inner loop. Let's prove that it has a bound n and let's multiply it by the outer loop. Then uh, you get a quadratic bound, but this is wrong. So 
uh, this also what makes bound, bound uh, computation more complicated because you uh, have to take you have a less compositional problem than than termination and still you want to somehow take advantage of the structure of your program and uh, so I will talk later how we uh, still get can get some compositionality in the problem so this is an example which we uh, found in actual benchmarks and uh, so every line is important so it's already sliced and uh, so you don't have to understand this program uh, I just want to point out that there are a lot of flags and so in order to be able to compute a bound you need to reason about these flags and so again uh, this requires some disjunctive reasoning and but interestingly this program has a complicated uh, bound and it has a max uh, expression inside and the uh, logarithm and and addition and <coughs> so uh, this just uh, should show you that the search search space for possible bounds is huge so uh, it's very really difficult to somehow predict the form how, how this looks like and uh, here I also want to give an answer directly uh, what we do by using the size change abstraction so we will the size change abstraction is about using uh, heuristics locally to extract possible parts of the ter of the of the bound and then uh, then reasoning only in the abstraction you compose these local entities to to a bound and so this is how we are able to to get such bounds <coughs> on the other hand uh, you see that this is uh, not a these are not linear uh, expressions and why is this a challenge so uh, most program analysis can only handle uh, linear constraints so uh, abstract domains are only linear most of the times and so you uh, uh, in order to get the bounds uh, we don't need to reason about the whole bound uh, I mean we have to get a ranking function uh, a bound out of the ranking function and for this we have only we we need to compute only upper bounds on the constituents of the ranking functions and thereby we are able to get uh, bounds for uh, such ranking functions. Okay, so I want to further tell you a bit about my intuition for the size change abstraction. So you shouldn't view the variables of the size change abstraction as integer variables, but they're rather some integer valued norm on the program, like the length of a list or uh, the height of a tree or some other any arithmetic expression over the over the states and then inequalities between such two norms they reflect the monotonic behavior of these entities so a single size change uh, transition denotes how the progress of the program is locally and then by only analyzing the abstract program you now get a nice separation between finding these norms locally and then trying to combine them to a global global bound so this is so this is really about giving you compositionality and uh, just as a short uh, yeah I just want to point out uh, on this example that the difference between a reachability bound and a loop bound so this is just a side remark that uh, if you look at how often uh, the statement L2 where the, resource, where the object C is allocated is how often this can be reached it's different how often uh, the, the loop uh, L1 will be executed so I just want to say that the reachability bound problem is a really different problem than only computing loop bounds okay so now uh, I want to tell you how we uh, actually do the, uh, the analysis on uh, on imperative programs and by this I will first tell you how we derive a transition system of the uh, for the program then uh, how we extract heuristics for for the size change abstraction and in the end a bit how we deal with control structure like in this complicated example we have seen at the beginning So uh, let's go back to this example with the inner loop and uh, so for this program 
we want to compute the reachability bound for the for the uh, outer loop. So how often the header of the outer loop can be reached, and uh, we will work with the uh, control flow of this program denoted like this, so where you uh, label every edge by a transition relation. So in order to uh, compute, uh, yeah, we will compute the transition system always with regard to one location and the location for which we want to compute the bounds. So for this, we will just take the strongly connected component, this location uh, lies in, and then we will compute this transition system, which is kind of a summary for this, uh, for this control location. So because, as I pointed out in the beginning, this junction is very important, we want to get, uh, we want to derive a transition system with maximum, which contains maximal disjunctive information. And uh, so in order to do so, the idea is to enumerate all paths, all possible passes from L1 back to this location L1. And uh, here we have uh, infinitely many paths because of an inner loop, so this uh, means a problem for this idea, and uh, in order to cope with that, the idea is to first recursively uh, compute a transition system for the for the inner loop and use this uh, for for summarizing the inner loop. And once we have then summarized the inner loop, we uh, just plug in the summary for the inner loop, and then we can use this idea of enumerating all paths to get a transition system for the outer loop. So what do we do for summarizing in a loop? So we derive this transition system recursively, uh, but then uh, in order to summarize it, you need to compute the transitive hull. And uh, so this transitive hull is representing arbitrary many iterations through the inner loop. And uh, <coughs> The nice thing about this is that we can use the same abstraction for summarizing inner loops. So we just take the transition system, size change abstracting it, and computing the transitive hull in the abstract. And uh, so this can be done uh, because there are only this abstraction is finite, and so we can compute the, the transitive hull, and then we just take it and uh, plug it in. Yeah, okay, I want to say a few words about the uh, transitive hull. Yeah. So, do you have to do this in the overall transition system or um, Yes, that's a good question. So, as I presented, we assume that uh, the uh, program is reducible, but this is not a limitation because uh, by doing case splits on the possible entries of strongly connected components, you uh, can derive a transition system in the same way. So you'll just say, okay, either we jump, yeah, you say either we jump in here or we jump in here, but let's compute a transition system for both and then just take the union of, of these computations. Yeah. And uh, because irreducible programs shouldn't, there shouldn't be a, a lot of non-determinism. So I would argue that uh, this could be done in practice, but we have not implemented it. So our implementation is only for reducible control flow graphs. Okay, so yeah, as I said before, the abstraction is finite and uh, is a power set domain. So we can compute transitive hulls and they have this nice property that we don't lose information with regard to termination. So when we compute the transitive hull, we have the property that the transitive hull terminates uh, if the original system terminates. And this means we don't lose any uh, yeah, properties about this progress. And so this is just uh, the motivation why probably it makes sense to do it that way. Mm, and uh, yeah, that's also the reason why you, can, uh, use, why you have a decidability result. Okay, then let's go back to this example. So uh, let us assume we obtained a summary with, uh, with two transitions and 
then we can now collect all passes for, from L1 back to L1. So we will get four, uh, uh, four possibilities. So one for the two transitions from L2 to L1 and uh, times two for the two uh, transitions of the summary. So this will result uh, in then four paths, which you have to concatenate. And <coughs> we actually, at that point, will check if the transitions are actually feasible. And this can rule out, uh, this will rule out two transitions in that case. So I want to discuss a bit uh, what happened here. So for this kind of analysis, uh, we have uh, coined the term pathwise analysis because uh, what we're really doing is abstraction or detecting infeasibility of complete paths. And so by complete paths, I mean if there are inner loops, we take the summaries of inner loops and plug them in, but then there will be no abstraction. So we just collect all the predicates on this path and then check if they are uh, yeah, check them for abstraction or for detecting infeasibility. And this really is a way for leveraging the progress in SMT solvers to static analysis because we will reason about our long paths, straight line paths of the program. And in this way, we will also get uh, uh, an analysis which is more precise than, than blockwise analysis. And I will explain this uh, later on. Uh, but so this is the answer uh, how we use the structure of programs. So our, our way of doing is summarizing inner loops, nested loops, using the summaries, plugging them in and going on. So this is possibly all what you can do for our bound analysis. Yes. Um, yeah, so I had this idea actually, so you can think about this like unrolling the program. And so this makes sense for some examples. Uh, but so they're not, so I thought of it theoretically, but so for implementing it, it doesn't make sense. But so like for many automatic static analysis, uh, they have this heuristic of unrolling it at some point of time and it would make sense for us as well. Yeah. So I again wanted to mention how, how this transition system generation is disjunctive. So on the one hand, we have uh, op the transition system are actually, uh, yeah, you can view them as DNF formulae. So we obtained them by enumerating cycle free paths. And so individual transition relations, they, are, uh, they do not contain this junction. So this works nicely with our bound computation later on. And so this proceeding like this is, is possibly expensive, uh, but in practice, uh, so this works most of the cases because we slice the program before. And so we have a few cases with time out, but mostly this works. Uh, a second disjunctive, uh, thing in this analysis is that we have summarized inner loops disjunctively. So we have, instead of arbitrary uh, enumerations to the inner loop, we use some finite uh, over approximation, but which still is disjunctive. So this is uh, how we answer the challenge uh, identified in the beginning. Okay, so I wanted to uh, contrast what we do with what size change abstraction does classically. So they would take uh, the control flow graph uh, which you get from the program and abstract every, every, uh, every edge directly and then do the analysis only on, in the abstract. And so for this example, uh, they will not be able to prove uh, even termination, and this is because at one point we, so after the loop, we decreased i if we executed the inner loop at least once, 
And because then you have an increase, decrease, you will lose all information if you only have inequalities. And <coughs> uh, but, but we were able to do so by using the summary first and then doing a complete pass analysis. And <coughs> yeah, to wrap up this discussion, uh, the classical size change abstraction abstracts blockwise. It abstracts the program only once in the beginning and then does the transitive hull computation only in the abstract. What we do is we always alternate between abstracting and transitive hull computation. And uh, so this, how often we do this is the, how often loops are nested. And by this we derive an analysis which is uh, more general and more precise than what has been done before. I don't know, actually. I, I wouldn't yeah, think. Yeah. So my intuition is that it would be the same, because you just delay the abstraction from the beginning. But um, I haven't thought about it, so it could be. OK. Um, so what we do for extracting uh, norms is uh, a template-based approach. So we will just compute the transition system, uh, as I showed you before, and then we will look at, at the formulas we obtained uh, from this transition system. And we just say uh, for every inequality which shows up in this, um, in this transition system, we will regard it as a candidate for, for a norm. So this means like if we have an inequality E1 greater than E2, E1 minus E2 is a candidate for, for a norm. And in order to really make it a, a norm, so a size change variable, uh, we, we want to know if it's useful on at least one transition. And uh, so we, we will check by an SMT solver if it actually decreases when, when taking this transition. And uh, yeah, so this is like, uh, if you have a simple for loop, then you increase uh, some variable i, you will check if it's less than n, and then uh, the conditions are met. So we include it. And yeah, the nice thing about this pattern-based technique is that you can capture a lot of iteration patterns which show up in uh, in, in normal uh, programs. So you can also come up with, uh, with rules for uh, iterations over bit vectors and over data structures, as long as you're able to express the, uh, your, the theory which you need by in an SMT solver. And then you, uh, you can, in the same way, come up with new patterns which you want to add to the abstraction. So this is more, <coughs> okay, so I want to discuss what we do here. So this is like, you can think of it as a heuristic for extracting predicates and predicate abstraction. So there you also go and look at uh, in, a so in conditions uh, of your program and take them as predicates. And all those template-based uh, approaches have been quite successful recently. And so uh, it's also good that uh, so the bounds which you report to the user are con are about identities and ent entities which actually show up in the in the program. So it will be easy to understand for the programmer. And so we do not take any uh, complicated arithmetic expression, but uh, you could include certain special cases. So you could say, for example, okay, you have identified that as a norm and this as a norm. And so, okay, because of this, it makes sense to also take the sum of, of the two uh, as a size change variable or the, or the difference or the logarithm or anything uh, which might be useful. Mm. 
Okay, then I want to tell you uh, what we do with, uh, with programs which have complicated uh, yeah, Boolean control structure like this. And <coughs> we'll apply our transition system algorithm and it will, and so there are just ifs, so in this case we'll just uh, uh, recite the number of transitions. So I've deleted the uh, infeasible ones. And uh, okay, so there is a bug in the slide. So the transition system, so what this was supposed to show you is that uh, we only have one location, but many different uh, transition relations. And uh, in order to make our life easier, we will do a program transformation before we do the actual bound computation. And the transformation we do has the following, uh, following idea behind us. So we want to uh, we want to add to every location which transition is going to be executed next. And if we know that, we can delete some infeasible uh, transitions. So going so adding this location, uh, adding which tra transition is executed next, is actually uh, uh, like a prophecy variable, which has been used by uh, Byron recently. So you add uh, like a look ahead of one to each state. And so this is a simple construction, which can be done by an SMT solver. And uh, it will, for this program, then look like, like this. And this is what we then use uh, afterwards. So I want to tell you how we do it because it's quite easy. So we just take the, the transition system and make a program where now every uh, where we add one control location for every transition. And then we say, okay, we have a transition to another transition uh, if the composition of the two transition is actually feasible. And so you just take the transition relations, concatenate them and uh, check this by an SMT solver. And uh, so what is the nice thing about adding uh, this control structure again? Uh, the nice thing about it is that you can get rid of uh, Boolean, uh, Booleans if you're lucky. So in this case it works. Uh, so if you, by our heuristics, we just have uh, these two sizes, uh, S and logarithm of C as, as norms, and then we abstract the transitions you, uh, you have seen before, then the transitions we obtain, they are a lot smaller because we got rid of all the Booleans and they are sufficient for the later uh, bound computation. Yeah. So this is not unrolling. So it's actually something different. So because unrolling means considering two uh, iterations of the loop at one time. But here we are not doing that. So we are just saying, okay, just uh, make a case distinction on what transition is going to execute it next, and then check for this if it's actually feasible. So these two program transformations are orthogonal. So you can say you can, there are programs which you can prove by, by, the, by one of them, but uh, the other not. Yeah, so this should show you that their flags are not present in the abstraction. And in this way, you can obtain a separation between invariant computation and the actual bound computation. And <coughs> yeah, how can we then now exploit the structure? Uh, yeah, so because we have encoded the uh, Boolean somehow in this structure here, so now we want to use the, the structure of this graph for bound computation. And uh, so we will compute the DAG of its strongly connected components. And uh, then, uh, yeah, so this somehow corresponds to the control structure of the loop. And then uh, we will go and compute bounds for each strongly connected component in isolation, and then uh, compose these bounds to an overall bound for the system. Yeah. So this is what I just said. And then you can, 
you can compose them as follows. So you will go through the different uh, levels of, of, the, of the strongly com connected component graph and say, okay, for every level we take the maximum and then we, we sum uh, all levels of, of this of the max expressions and actually then you have to go on and compute uh, upper bounds for each of these expressions by some invariant analysis. And this gives you the, the, the bound we have just, uh, we have seen in the beginning. Okay, so then what is finally missing is how we compute uh, bounds for, for uh, single strongly connected components. And the, the thing which we are actually doing is something, uh, something quite simple. So it's, it's, uh, it's a greedy algorithm. And I want to point out that we are not using the full power of size change abstraction because this is already uh, coping with a lot of examples which uh, uh, occur in, in practice. And I want to say this is because it's an interesting abstraction and you could possibly extend it uh, in cases where you need more power. Okay, so what, what are we doing? So let's assume we have a control flow graph like this and these are the four uh, transitions. So what we do is then <coughs> we, uh, in the first step, we compute a set of, of uh, norms that are non-increasing uh, for all transitions and which are uh, bounded and decreasing at at least one transition. So the second condition means so that it's uh, useful as a, local, as a ranking function for at least one transition. And the first condition says, okay, it's never increased on the other transition. And uh, so then we can uh, we can just take the sum of all these norms and go on with a recursive computation. So we just say, okay, now we've bounded some of these transitions. So every time they get executed, they will decrease one of these norms. And so we can just delete these transitions and show that, okay, if you only execute, uh, execute the rest of the transitions, then also this cannot be done infinitely often. And for, so you get a bound, recursive bound out of this. And then you have to take this recursive obtained bound and multiply it uh, with that. Okay, so you can, you can think of it as a lexicographic ranking functions with upper bounds. So this allows you then to, to multiply it. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, what we have done is, uh, so we have implemented uh, the analysis I have, I've told you about in uh, our tool uh, called Lupus which is built over the LLVM compiler framework. So we read in C source code. Uh, we have used Yikes as our logical reasoning engine. Uh, so our tool is not, uh, is not completely sound because we have uh, some optimistic assumption about aliasing. So basically we assume no aliasing. So when the uh, L values are syntactically different, then they are treated differently by our analysis. But uh, so this uh, didn't, so we didn't uh, find any problems with this in practice. So for now, uh, it's okay because, yeah. And uh, so we <coughs> have used the C bench benchmark, which is a compiler optimization benchmark. So it contains all the core utils of Unix, like uh, BSIP, uh, Huffman encodings, graphics algorithms. So we've analyzed this code and we were able to get uh, bounds for three quarters of, of the loops appearing there. So our analysis is quite fast, so we can handle most of the loops in, uh, in four seconds and <coughs> some more in thousand seconds. And so there are some uh, timeouts, but there are not so many that we are actually trying to optimize our analysis. So in cases where we fail is that so we have uh, not sufficient support for, for invariance, numeric invariance, and uh, so we cannot handle memory updates or pointer arithmetic. Uh, so we don't have irreducible control flow graphs. And so some loops are not meant to terminate and we cannot detect it. 
and uh, so there are also this uh, difficult guys which would need complex invariants. Yeah, so the, for the first one, I would uh, expect that you can implement uh, like numeric analysis, which is strong enough to uh, to show the properties you want. Okay, so yeah, this concludes my talk. Um, I hope I could convince you that uh, the size change abstraction is the uh, is the right formalism for dealing with bound analysis of imperative programs and. Uh, the contributions are that we've given the uh, first algorithm for computing bounds with the size change abstraction. And uh, we've also shown how you can actually apply size change abstraction to imperative programs, because before it was only used for uh, functional and declarative languages. Okay, I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, so the intuition is that so most of the times uh, in, in, in programs you just have uh, like entities which are increased or decreased all the time and the complication stems from how these uh, local progresses uh, are combined to, to an overall progress. Yeah. Okay, so what, what Byron is pointing out that uh, so what is actually done by uh, Terminator or this new tool is not the construction of this transition invariant only, but also the proof that this inclusion actually holds. And this is proven inductively, and so there is some resemblance uh, in this tool to what, what, what uh, I was making explicit before by uh, by doing this, because if you compute the transitive hull with size change abstraction, it's kind of an inductive proof too. And uh, <coughs> so, like the difference, uh, as I see it, is that so we are going to collect the the norms before we are doing the the abstraction. And when we are doing the abstraction, so we have obtained some norms for one program pass and some norms for another program pass. But when we abstract, so we'll also see how the norms of this pass change on that pass, so that we have this information then available if we uh, do the actual bound computation. And so the question would be how you can then take this proof and extend all these measures obtain, obtained here and there also on the other side of the proof. And uh, yeah, and but so the question is also really so there are, there are two extreme choices our tools. So we are really doing a greedy uh, abstract interpretation, and more Byron's tool is like doing like a really lazy with minimal information as possible proof and how you could. So there's a lot of room in between how uh, things could be done. Yeah, so this could be done possibly if you're missing like a greater to zero or somewhere. Are you in a good position to do that, do you think? 
Um, so I don't know actually because you have to do this symbolic backward uh, like weakest precondition computation and I don't know how this could be done. I don't know. <laughs>